Welcome back, everybody, to What the Health. I am Dr. Greg Eckel, and I have my esteemed guest, Dr. David Perlmutter, on today talking about his book, Drop Acid, The Surprising New Science of Uric Acid, The Key to Losing Weight, Controlling Sugar, and Achieving Extraordinary Health. I'm going to give a proper adieu to Dr. Perl. Perlmutter. He is a board-certified neurologist and fellow of the American College of Nutrition, frequent lecturer at symposia sponsored by institutions including the World Bank, Columbia University, New York University, Yale, Harvard, and serves as an associate professor at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. He's the five-time New York best-selling author and recipient of numerous awards, including the Linus Pauling Award for his innovative approaches to neurologic disorders, uh, the National Nutrition Foods Association Clinician Year uh, of the Clinician of the Year Award, and the Humanitarian of the Year Award from American College of Nutrition. Really, the the accolades and uh, achievements uh, precede you, Dr. Perlmutter, and welcome aboard. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me today, Dr. Eckel. I love, one, I'm coming to you from the home of Linus Pauling. So I love that you received that out here in Portland, Oregon. And um, also the title of your book, Drop Acid, you would think, and you start the book out with saying like, this is not the Kool-Aid test. This is not the uh, the electric Kool-Aid acid test. And um, this all started with when you were on a run. Can you get That's it? That's right. Yeah. Well, my, um, you know, my mission is to really do whatever I can to help people regain metabolic health. And what does that mean? You know, everybody talks about metabolism and it means things like getting your blood sugar where it needs to be, uh, getting your body mass index, losing some fat, getting that where it needs to be, lowering your blood pressure if it's elevated, getting your lipids back in order, your good and bad cholesterol and reining in your triglycerides. All of these factors are really fundamentally important because they are related to the global pandemic that you and I and everyone else on the planet by definition are experiencing right now. This is a global pandemic, the likes of which we've never experienced before. Uh, and according to the World Health Organization, the number one cause of death on our planet, it is not contagious and it's very much uh, related to our lifestyle choices. This is the global pandemic of chronic degenerative conditions mm. like heart disease, like diabetes, like Alzheimer's, certain form, forms of cancer, not, not a virus. Uh, so unfortunately, these diseases don't get as much attention as a transmissible virus. And yet this is the number one cause of death on our planet. And importantly, in, uh, related to what I just said, very much related to our lifestyle choices. So. You know, my mission is to uh, help people understand how they can regain better control over metabolism. Mm -hmm. Originally, that related to uh, my interest in things like Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is related to metabolic disturbances. We know that risk for Alzheimer's is dramatically increased in people with elevated uh, blood pressure. We know that obesity predicts risk for Alzheimer's. We know that becoming a type two diabetic related to lifestyle choices may as much as quadruple a person's risk for getting Alzheimer's, a disease for which we have no pharmaceutical treatment. So, you know, it really is fundamentally important that we pay a lot of attention on the front end to keeping ourselves metabolically intact. And as you well said, um, I'm running along one day listening to a podcast, interviewing somebody I had, didn't know anything about, a Dr. Richard Johnson in uh, University of Colorado. And he made it very clear that uric acid that I had thought about only in the context of gout, but that uric acid is really playing an important role in regulating our metabolism such that when uric acid is elevated, it's an alarm signal, a survival signal for our bodies that we may not have food tomorrow. We better make fat, we better store fat, we better ratchet down our metabolism so we can keep our energy because otherwise we might die from starvation. And that was really important uh, in the day, right? In our hunter-gatherer days, and certainly even before that in our primate ancestors. Uh, now we are signaling that pathway every single day to prepare for 
the winter that basically never comes. And now that we've identified it, identified it, it's a home run because now we can use this understanding uric acid, lower our uric acid very uh, specifically, very easily, and help to bring our metabolism back in, in check. And this has a huge impact on, again, what the World Health Organization has characterized as the number one cause of death on our planet. And let me just add that uh, our life expectancy has be, been declining really precipitously, and it started before COVID. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, we've reached the peak, and now our life expectancy is declining because of the rampant rise in obesity, the rampant increase in people with diabetes and high blood pressure. You know, 10% of, of kids 12 to 18 years old have high blood pressure now. Wow. Uh, by 2030, one half of American adults won't just be overweight, but actually obese, half, one in two. Wow. Uh, so these numbers are, are astounding. We have uh, 34 million type two diabetics uh, in uh, America today, and we have about um, 80 million uh, so-called pre-diabetics. So, you know, 40% of adults in America now is either diabetic or pre-diabetic. And 40%. You know, I'll just say before I pass it back to you that, um, yeah. This notion of, well, I'm okay for now. I don't have diabetes. I only have pre-diabetes. You're yeah. already at risk for some really serious stuff that now that you're pre-diabetic. It's not like it's binary, whether you are or you're not. I mean, there are very few things in medicine. Pregnancy, you're either pregnant or you're not. But as it relates to your blood sugar, uh, you can have a dramatically increased risk of blood, uh, of, uh, of Alzheimer's, for example, when your blood sugar is 110. Mm. You're, you're barely into the pre-diabetic range, and yet people are thinking, oh, I'm nowhere near diabetes. You're already in trouble. My mission is to give people tools to improve their metabolism and therefore really have a, a powerful tool to reduce their risk for, for these chronic degenerative conditions. I love it. I am so aligned with that mission and what why I have this platform called What the Health is to educate folks on what they can do. I mean, metabolic health is the thing and you have unpacked it so well in Drop Acid. Uh, I'm excited. I'm going to do the diet. So I'm going to go through your program because it just seems like I, this could help so many people with a lot of the top four killers. You know, we, we have a longevity bent here. Neurodegeneration, brain health, and longevity are the folks that are listening in on this podcast. And they want to know, well, how can they live a, a healthy, long health span? And that's and right. Do it with their brains and with their brawn and with community. This component, one, I mean, you've touched on so many things on just the state of the union, our health. Like that, those stats are staggering and we're clearly, there's not a pill to take to get us out of that. Like that, the levels of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and then you find it linked to this kind of simple metabolite that we learned in medical school was just a waste product and involved right. with gout, the King's disease, right? Of a rich diet. What, just in general, what uric acid, what is it like, what, how are you reframing it? Because you have this concept called asymptomatic hyperuricemia, which I think I'm never going to forget. And I'm going to be helping to get the word out on this because that is, it's asymptomatic. So there's that uric acid, there's the other component on blood test values and what is quote unquote normal versus the proposal, which I believe in is the optimum level. So there you brought go. a couple of those out. So I want to make sure we touch on that during this interview. But let's start at the basics of like uric acid, you know, we, we only learned about it in gout. So what, right. where is it now? So we learned about it in gout, uh, as related to gout, because clearly high levels of uric acid, you know, once it's really high, it starts to precipitate out of the blood and forms crystals. They can end up in your great toe. Uh, they also end up in your heart uh, arteries. They end up in your prostate. There's a lot of places where gut crystals accumulate. But the reason we didn't spend a lot of time on it in medical school was really quite simple because you have high uric acid, you take allopurinol, move on. I mean, mm. that's, you know, it's yeah. very straightforward. Right. And 
you know, the truth of the matter is that um, until a couple of years ago, I didn't know this information. And you would ask me about uric acid and I would say gout. Yeah. Uh, but the, the truth of the matter is that there is extensive research for 20 years, two decades, looking at this uric acid as far more than the end product of, of fructose metabolism or alcohol metabolism, or the breakdown product of what we call purines. That's what forms when our bodies break down tissues that have DNA and RNA or eat foods that are rich in DNA and RNA. It forms purines. That end pathway is uric acid. Well, as is so often the case uh, in nature, things get, uh, there are multiple things that the that metabolites do. And as is the case with uric acid, it evolved as a powerful alarm signal, uh, generally as the, uh, as a downstream effect of eating fructose. So our ancestors didn't have fructose year round. They had it when the fruit was ripe and the fruit was ripe at the end of the summer and in the early fall, we would suddenly get a little blast of fructose and it would signal our bodies a couple of things. First, that this is a safe food to eat because sweet foods are not poisonous. And the other thing it would do is it would tell our physiology, make fat because winter is coming. Make more blood sugar to power your brain because you might not have enough calories on board to power your brain and you need your brain because you're a human because we're not the strongest, we're not the fastest, we can't outrun predators. So we need our brains to be working so we can be clever and find food and avoid being uh, avoid predation, being eaten. Mm -hmm. So these mechanisms evolved over millions of years uh, under a given set of circumstances. So we have this relationship then between our evolution and our environment. And what we are experiencing now is an evolutionary environmental mismatch. Our evolution, meaning our physiology, is designed with thrifty genes to make and store calories as much as it possibly can to keep us in a place of having energy availability when we can't find food. And in addition to prevent us from being dehydrated, and you might ask yourself, well, gee, I don't get how that works. How is uh, making fat keeping us from being dehydrated? And as I talk about in the book, the example I love to use is this, there's a unique animal that is able to go for three weeks and drinks no water, and it can actually walk across the desert, believe it or not. And what is unique about this animal is it has a great big hump on its back that allows it to not drink water. And what's inside that hump? Fat. The camel's hump is full of 80 pounds of fat. Why? because as it's burning the fat for energy, it's making two things, carbon dioxide that it exhales and metabolic water. So fat is not just a resource of calories for energy, but it's also a resource from which camels and whales and hummingbirds and you and I can make metabolic water. So this has been a powerful hedge, not only against starvation, but dehydration as well. And over millions of years, the elevation of uric acid that tells the body to make fat has become more and more strengthened in primates and then in humans. Uh, we lost an enzyme about 15 million years ago in our primate ancestry that's called uricase. Uricase would have broken down the uric acid into other things that we would excrete like a lantern. But that said, we lost the function of that enzyme. So instead of breaking it down and excreting it, we retain higher and higher levels of uric acid and it kept us alive. Wow. So through that lens, making body fat, raising blood sugar, raising blood pressure are wonderful things, becoming insulin resistant, powerfully wonderful survival mechanism in the context of, of not having any food to eat. Wow. But these days, again, we are targeting this me uh, message, this signaling message, 365 days a year, again, for uh, the winter that never comes. Huh. So the idea that it's uric acid that's sounding the alarm is really very fortunate for us because now that we understand that we can target uric acid and have yet another tool in the toolbox to combat things like our obesity epidemic, the hypertension epidemic, and certainly the insulin resistance slash uh, diabetes epidemic, because we know that one powerful pathway 
that augments these players is the elevation of uric acid. Again, coming from three sources. Actually, there's four, but three in terms of our diets. The sugar fructose, and that does not necessarily mean fruit. Uh, alcohol, and there's certain types of alcohol that are worse than others. And the breakdown products of certain foods called uh, that are called purines. We find lots of purines in liver and kidney and shellfish like mussels and scallops. Doesn't mean that you can't eat them. It just means you have to be cognizant of the amount that you're eating. Uh, fructose is in our modern day, by, by and large, the, the biggest issue. I mean, our fructose consumption here in America has gone up a thousand percent between 1970 and 1990 in lockstep with the elevation of our uh, uric acid level. Fructose over five grams at a time will overwhelm the small intestine, make its way to the liver and be metabolized into this alarm signal that we call uric acid. And as such, stimulates our bodies to make more glucose stimulates our bodies to raise our blood pressure as a preventive against dehydration, stimulates our bodies to make fat, store fat, and ratchet down our metabolism by damaging the function of our mitochondria. Now, that's not a good thing. In, in our modern world, we know that's bad news. So much of what we deal with uh, in chronic degenerative conditions, and especially in my world as a neurologist, like Alzheimer's, uh, is underpinned by dysfunction or challenging damage to the mitochondria, the energy parts of our cells. So again, in the context of our ancestors, great. Uric acid up, raised uric acid, survival. But in the context of you and me today, high uric acid, bad news bears. We don't want to do it. We want to do everything we can to prevent it. And step one is getting your uric acid level checked and figure out where in the heck you are on this whole uh, continuum. Yeah, so let's talk about that on, uh, on uric acid and checking because there are, and, and just lab work in general uh, around what the normal is, how really people don't understand that that is not healthy. And, uh, and then what are we looking at? You, you recommend in the book weekly testing um, on the uric acid. Now, this is part of people's typical annual blood work that is on there. It's just, there's nothing special about it. I mean, we've known about uric acid. I mean, you, you point out to some physicians that, I mean, even back to the 1800s talking about uric acid, but you've got some specifics on, you know, what to look for in your blood work, um, and then also how to measure it. Um, in addition to, it's not just uric acid by itself, in combination for you know diabetes, uh, diabetes basically we'll call it obesity and diabetes, um, etc. So where where do you go with that? Again, people can get a uric acid level at their doctor's office, and to know what your level is or was, it might be as simple as a phone call because it's yeah. generally included in your annual blood work, but un unfortunately only in the context of gout. Meaning when you call the doctor now and ask for your level. A she or he is going to say, well, it's in the normal range, meaning it's below seven. The number seven milligrams per deciliter uh, really only relates to gout. Gout risk is lower below seven. Cardiometabolic problems, you want that number below 5.5. So mm. uh, we have to, first of all, get away from what is what we are told is in the normal range because nobody wants to be normal these days. Oh. Normal is average and average in America is not that great. Let's be clear. Yes. You want to be in the optimal zone and that would be below 5.5. Now, then you can go to your doctor's office and have it done. You can ask the doctor to call the lab because I'm going to go there tomorrow morning. I want my uric acid level checked. Or you can buy a monitor. You can check your uric acid just like that. We'll look at mine. My last level was 4.7. I'm not sure if that's showing up. Yeah, there but, it is. Um, it's a simple finger stick like your blood work. And every two weeks, check it. If you're running really low and in the in a good range, you could check it once a month or every few months if you're you know not making any dramatic changes uh, in your lifestyle, most importantly, in your diet. Levels should be uh, checked first thing in the morning before you eat and not after a real, real vigorous exercise protocol the day before. That would be more than your, your typical workout. Uh, and again, our goal is uh, lower than 5.5. Seven is unacceptable. Mm. 
Uh, levels above seven are associated with about an 80% uh, percent increased risk of dementia, mm -hmm. a 55% percent increased risk of specifically Alzheimer's, and a 166% percent increase in, in what is called mixed or vascular dementia. So that's just having uric acid above seven. Wow. And the average in America is six. So one study uh, that was uh, published, I think, in 2009, uh, followed a, a group of individuals, 90,000 adults, 42,000 men and 48,000 women, followed them for eight years. And what they found was that those who had uh, a uric acid level above a seven had a, a significant risk uh, increase of what is called all-cause mortality. They had a 16% increased risk of death from any cause. Yeah. They had a 38% increased risk of death from a cardiac event and a 35% increased risk of death from a stroke. And for every point elevation above seven, there was an additional eight to 13% increased risk of death, again, from any cause whatsoever. We call that all-cause mortality. So these are what we call correlative studies. They correlate risk of death with the original uric acid at the beginning of the study but now that we understand the mechanisms in terms of what uric acid is doing in the body, the risk for death from stroke and heart attack are very clear because of the role of uric acid in raising blood pressure, as well as how it raises body fat and how it uh, increases blood sugar. Mm. All of those things contribute to risk for death, uh, certainly from stroke, heart attack, and you know, basically from all causes. Now, I can imagine with those staggering statistics, some of our listeners and viewers are going to try to get their uric acid levels very, very low. But there is a U-shaped uh, status of the Goldilocks component of these numbers that you write about so eloquently in the book. Um, will you share that as well so that you know more less is not always better on these things, right? That's right. Um generally for, for virtually everybody, it's getting your uric acid level below 5.5. And it turns out that really low uric acid levels are actually not a risk. Uh, there is a correlation between very low uric acid levels and frailty and uh, Alzheimer's and things like cancer, but it's really because those individuals have lost so much body mass that they're not making their purines are not breaking down their body tissue anymore to make purines to keep the uric uh, acid levels up. So it, it, it the, you know, to construe that wow. to say, well, therefore we should get our uric acid levels at the, the very best range. Right. I think for everybody, get your levels below 5.5. If they're lower than that I, I, and you're out doing your life and, and healthy, I would not worry about it. Okay, perfect. And the component you wrote about on, you know, that 15 million years ago, we lost that enzyme. Are there other genetic predispositions for folks around uric acid metabolism? Uh, any SNPs that you became aware of through your research? There aren't any SNPs in particular as it relates to uric acid uh, excretion or dealing with uric acid because we don't do that. Okay. We basically do not have uh, the ability to excrete uric acid. So... Uh, there's nothing genetic going on there because every human on the planet has lost the uricase genes. There are actually yeah. several of them. Now, there is some discussion about uh, SNPs in a, another enzyme, a code, that code for another enzyme called xanthine oxidase. And that's an important enzyme in the creation of uric acid. Some people have higher levels of this xanthine oxidase activity, and therefore they're uh, more likely to develop a higher level of uric acid. Others have a lower level therefore less uric acid. But the difference between the higher and the lower is not that dramatic. So there's not a huge input in terms of their genetic polymorphisms as it relates to risk uh, for high uric acid. We know that, uh, again, there is some familial risk for gout, but by and large, uh, the big issue is the diet and how that relates to uric acid uh, production via the purines, the high purine foods, the alcohol, and certainly uh, fructose. So let's talk about that. Maybe, you know, this is really um, explicitly stated in the book, but for on the podcast today, like simple dietary edits that we can really tune into 
before we get your book uh, on how to reduce fructose. Um, you're not saying eliminate fruit from the diet. That's right. Uh, fruit actually, you know, an apple has five grams of fructose and that's about what your small intestine is able to deal with it and use appropriately uh, and doesn't really cause much problem. What happens is when we get about four or five grams in a single bolus or a single push through the gut, uh, it overrides the small intestine's ability to deal with it. And what happens then is it makes its way into the liver through the portal system. And it's in the liver where the, the problems begin. That excess fat is created, uh, that uric acid is created, although uric acid can be created in, in other areas in the body. So we want to avoid pounding the body with a sudden surge of fructose like you might get if you drink fruit, to, uh, fruit juice or mm. a soda or use a lot of sauces that have a lot of fructose in them, barbecue sauce, whatever it may be. You know, fructose finds its way into about 60% of the grocery store packaged foods that are available for people to eat. Why? Because they're sweet and we love our sweet. So you have to be a good label reader and recognize that clever uh, packaging people have disguised the name fructose, knowing that it gives food a bad rap. Uh, with other different names. Well, guess what? We call out in the book the various hidden uh, nom de plumes of, uh, of fructose so you can be a, a, you know, a, a good consumer and understand what marketing is trying to do uh, to trick wow. you. Uh, but that said, beyond just having low uh, fructose uh, inherent in fruit, it has fiber and fiber tends to slow the absorption of fructose. That's a good thing. You know, you, you don't eat an apple in, in like you gulp down fruit juice. So you're, you, the yeah. way it's delivered to your body is a little bit slower. Uh, fruit has vitamin C that aids in uric acid excretion. And it also has uh, bioflavonoids that actually target the enzyme we mentioned earlier, xanthine oxidase. And therefore the production of uric acid is a little bit decreased, but you can overdo it. Uh, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but five apples a day and the doctor, you will pay. Uh -huh. and the point being is, uh, you know, look at a bear getting ready to hibernate. It's just eating tons and tons of fruit day in and day out. And that fructose is, is stimulating fat production so that the bear then uh, has a calorie resource that it uses while it's in hibernation. And while its brain activity is dramatically reduced by mitochondrial a down regulation. Uh, you know, all of these same things happen in us when we're eating a lot of fructose. We're making fat, we're turning off brain mitochondrial function, we're increasing blood pressure, increasing our blood sugar through gluconeogenesis. And just to get a little tech weenie about all this, it's yeah. very interesting uh, when you think about what is going on in the physiology of a bear. We have a pathway that we want to keep active. It's called AMPK, adenosine monophosphate kinase, if for anyone who's going to take the quiz when we're done. But AMPK, when we stimulate or AMPK is active, that's what we want. It's telling our bodies the hunting is good, meaning you don't need to store fat. You don't need to make fat. We can keep the brain happy. We don't have to even make blood sugar from the liver because everything is cool. That's AMPK being lit up. But AMPK has an evil twin and it's called AMPD or AMP deaminase. And when AMP deaminase is lit up, it's telling you prepare for hibernation, mm. make fat, store fat, make blood sugar, raise blood pressure, uh, and make some glucose for your brain. So that's the evil twin of AMP kinase. Uric acid shuts off AMP kinase, shuts off what we want to be active and is amplifying the activity of this AMP deaminase, the evil twin, mm -hmm. such that it's telling our bodies through this mechanism, it could go one way or the other. Are we going down AMP kinase and gonna be thin, lean and mean, and uh, don't have to be mean, but being lean and in shape, <laughs> or AMP deaminase, and uric acid is what flips that switch. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people probably have heard of AMP kinase. There's a lot talked about in terms of what we can do to amplify it. And, uh, two of the most power or three of the most powerful inputs to keep AMP kinase lit up. Number one would be exercise. Mm. Aerobic exercise especially turns on AMP kinase and tells the body you're doing great. We're not gonna make you fat. 
exercise is through that lens is far more than just burning calories, right? It's changing our physiology, telling us we don't have to make and store fat. Another thing that activates AMP kinase and tells it you don't have to make sugar in the body is a drug called metformin. That's probably the, the most commonly used drug for type two diabetes. And what it does is it stimulates this AMP kinase telling the body stop making extra blood sugar. We don't need it. The hunting is good. Mm. So your, your blood sugar comes down if you're diabetic. And the third thing, there are, there are actually several others, but the third important thing, because it plays into our uric acid story, is a nutritional supplement, a bioflavonoid called quercetin available online, available at your local health food store. And quercetin targets AMP kinase, turns it on, but it also targets the enzyme xanthine oxidase and works just like the gout drug mm. allopurinol and is associated with a dramatic reduction in uric acid. One study done in England of 22 young men with mild elevation of their uric acid, they took 500 milligrams of, uh, of quercetin. And in eight weeks, they had dropped their uric acid level. No other changes by about 8%, which is very significant. So, hmm. you know, I know I got a little into the weeds there, but I think, you know, oh, your, your viewers are going to hear about AMPK from other people that you uh, interviewed. Yeah, no, that's, that's sure. a, that's a great piece in the longevity uh, space. You know, there's a lot of talk of that. And um, so to see how that ties in that, that was great. Thank you for that. Sure. The, um, so what about purines? So you've talked about purines. You've talked about a couple of foods that are rich in purines. You know, this is like the, the king's diet, rich in lots of proteins. Um, do you have in, as part of your love diet uh, a, a component around reducing those foods or? Sure. So let me, let me just uh, describe the acronym, the love diet, L-U-V. Yes. Yeah. L-U-V stands for lower uric value. So just so people know, there are 40 recipes in the book. And you know, it, it really is uh, focused on, of course, not having uh, any recipes with added fructose of any sort. Mm -hmm. There will always be fructose in fruit and in vegetables, that's for sure. Uh, but it's uh, even for foods that are traditionally considered higher in purines that gout patients were told to avoid. You know, if you're careful with how much you eat of the anchovies, sardines, scallops, mussels, liver, and kidney, it's not that big of a threat. The reality is that as it relates to purines, which become uric acid, that two thirds of the purines are actually generated in your own body and not related to the foods that you eat. They're the byproduct of breaking down tissue that you do when you exercise. So your body deals with those purines and that does contribute somewhat to the purine pool. It's the reason I mentioned earlier, when you have your uric acid level checked, don't do it the morning after a, you know, you normally run three miles and yesterday you ran a half marathon. You don't, that would be a mistake. So don't change your exercise regimen um, prior to having your uric acid checked. And of course, do it fasting. Takes us to one other topic and that is alcohol. Mm. Uh, and it, it really, uh, what very large data sets are telling us is that hard alcohol is associated significantly with raised uric acid. Hmm. And, you know, as I think about that, you know, what's hard alcohol? Well, gin, for example, I'm just choosing gin. Sure. Uh, and what is a gin and tonic? I mean, so you're getting the alcohol and then you get the tonic. And the tonic is a very, very sweet uh, mixer, right? And, you, you know, yeah. you think of all these daiquiris and all these drinks that people seem to like, a pina colada that are loaded with sugar and at the same time alcohol. It's not a good mix. You know, you wonder why uh, obesity rates in you know, uh, people in their 20s and 30s are going up so quickly. Huh. And I think you, you have to understand that's alcohol and it's also, uh, you know, pretty big slug of sugar. Wine consumption in men is associated with no effect on uric acid and in women, particularly red wine, and actually a, a little bit lower uric acid from drinking wine, not going overboard, of course. Sure. Uh, and beer is the worst player of all. Why? Because it's an alcoholic drink but it's very high in purines because it's made with yeast. Mm -hmm. Yeast is very cellular, has a lot of uh, uh, nuclear material and therefore contributes dramatically to the purine pool and will raise uric acid level dramatically 
which tells the body make fat. So we now get where the beer belly is coming from because we're signaling a pathway to make fat. Japan now is offering uh, purine free beers. They beer uh, various types of beer. They actually are way ahead in, in terms of understanding the role of elevated uric acid in hypertension, in obesity. And that's why purine free beer is one of the things that they've made available. And, and they're actually treating now high blood pressure by lowering uric acid, by giving gout drugs and seeing oh. significant lowering of the blood pressure. Well, I just mentioned uh, that um, just using quercetin also targets the exact same enzyme. So uh, quite interesting to see. Uh, that said, uh, again, the biggest player is the, the fructose. We talked about that. But there's one other thing that we have to talk about, and it is that you can be fructose free. And yet, the uh, unfortunate other part of the, uh, of the equation is that your body can make its own fructose. <laughs> so we'll talk about it. Uh, our bodies can convert glucose to sorbitol to fructose through what is called the polyol pathway. And it does so when the body is stressed and needs to have higher levels mm -hmm. of uric acid. Even though you're not even eating the fructose, what might that look like? What might that stress be? Well, dehydration, and this gets back to fat as a resource for metabolic water. If your body is dehydrated or your body thinks it's dehydrated, it activates the pathway to turn glucose, blood sugar, into fructose, then becomes uric acid and makes more body fat to protect itself because the body fat can become water. And how does your body know that it's dehydrated? It knows it's dehydrated because your sodium level goes up. You have a patient in the emergency room dehydrated, their sodium level is through the roof. You give them free water carefully and their sodium level comes down, but you have to do it slowly and carefully. Otherwise, various issues can happen. Uh, but that said, that's a normal mechanism. But you can raise your sodium by parking yourself in front of the TV and eating a bag of salted pretzels. And you're getting the refined carbs to, that are also not going to do any good. But when you eat a lot of salt, your sodium level will tick up a couple of points and it doesn't take much. That sets into motion this process to make fructose in your body, increase uric acid, make fat. And this now explains why people with higher salt consumption uh, have a higher risk for obesity. People with high salt consumption have a higher risk for type 2 diabetes. And we've known the high salt consumption relationship to high blood pressure for an awful long time. But this is really connecting some dots that we we're puzzling over for an awful long time. The relationship between eating a non-calorie food flavoring thing called salt and <laughs> gaining weight. How in the world could that be? Well, it does so because that's an alarm activator, turning on uric acid saying, make fat and raise your blood pressure and raise your blood sugar from eating excess salt. What's the answer? If you did it, now you've eaten that whole bag of pretzels, the game is over, <laughs> How did uh, you, you turn off that? the TV. Pardon me? <laughs> How did you know that? The pretzels. All you gotta do <laughs> is drink water. So if you drink water and hydrate, you will dilute down that sodium and you won't activate that pathway, problem solved. I'm not saying park yourself with a bag of uh, pretzels or whatever, <laughs> chips, and then afterwards drink water and think that you're totally absolved of your sins. <laughs> That's a little harsh. Yeah. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, water consumption is a great way to offset sudden salt consumption. You know what? You go to a restaurant and the, you, and the meal is clearly salty. You find yourself wanting to drink water afterwards. Do it. Drink a lot yeah. of salt. So you might be up sometime in the middle of the night uh, a couple of times. It happens. Uh, but you definitely want to dilute down that sodium. Got it. And, and that, um, so many people, I mean, that is the number one recommendation coming into my office is around hydration, right? Everything works better with hydration. Now we have this uric acid component in here as well, post-salt consumption for basically the, the basic metabolic issues that are killing the majority of people in the country. Um, I think well said. Let me just make it clear. People don't drink enough water. They're drinking all kinds of other things. Sports drinks, very high in fructose. 
um, you know, and thinking, well, it's a sports drink, therefore sports are good for me. Therefore the sports drink is right. good for me. You know, mm -hmm. if there was an alarm right now, I'd push a button and go, eh, yes. not true. You got read labels and see what in the heck is this stuff that you're drinking? Yeah. The, and what, what it gets marketed as a health beverage um, right. really is putting our metabolic health at risk and um, leading. I mean, it's just a, an overconsumptive component that's happening there that where you can have a COVID virus, which the predominant thing leading to death of people getting that virus is their metabolic health is we're not healthy. Like that's the, the bottom line here. So that's where this book and you're, you're researching and pulling it together for us is really doing a great service for us. Well, specifically uh, in May of 21, a study was done uh, of patients entering the hospital with COVID. And what did they do? They measured their uric acid levels. Mm. And what they found, they divided them up into four groups from lowest to highest. Those who came into hospital in the highest level of uric acid compared to those in the lowest level of uric acid, they had about a three-fold increased risk of things like uh, going into the ICU, being put on a ventilator, or dying. So those are pretty strong endpoints that you know are binary. You knew, you know, when you went to the ICU, you certainly would remember if you were intubated, and you probably remember. Uh, I would guess if you died, or maybe you wouldn't know. I don't know. But the point is, it's a heck of an endpoint, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, to have that risk increase threefold. Uh, that correlates with your high level of uric acid. And it gets back to what you just said that, you know, here's a marker of metabolic dysfunction. And we know that metabolic issues bode poorly for people mm -hmm. who are hospitalized with COVID. Uh, and in general, you don't even have to have COVID or be hospitalized. Having these metabolic issues is a bad thing. Uh, your risk of death from heart disease and Alzheimer's and cancer uh, and kidney disease and liver failure is dramatically increased. So that gets back to our original uh, question about, you know, what what's the motivation for writing a book about uric acid? Because it's about maintaining and or regaining, as it may be the case, uh, metabolic health. You know, 88% of American adults has at least one component of the metabolic syndrome. That means one in only one in eight American adults is metabolically health, intact or healthy. Wow. Only one out of eight people. So we need all the help we can get. Will and, you um, go through the the components of that metabolic health? So that, because there are certain markers for folks sure. to understand there. So yeah. it's called metabolic syndrome, and it comprises five things: uh, high body weight or body mass index, elevated blood sugar with insulin resistance, elevated blood pressure elevation of the blood triglycerides and abnormalities of the lipids, meaning the good and the bad cholesterol. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have any of those. Uh, you sure as heck don't want to have uh, elevated blood sugar and become diabetic. And um, uric acid directly influences that. Uric acid inhibits the function and the production of a specific chemical in the blood vessel called nitric oxide. So uric acid says turns off nitric oxide. We need nitric oxide for two very important functions. It allows blood vessels to relax so we can send blood to the brain, the heart, the kidneys, the liver, everywhere. And we need nitric oxide to work to allow insulin to do its job to keep our blood sugars in check. So now you understand how uric acid directly relates to high blood pressure and the stroke risk, heart attack risk, and all the stuff that are downstream from that. And how uric acid, because it inhibits how insulin works, because it inhibits nitric oxide, how it relates to high blood sugar and therefore risk uh, for type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Nitric oxide is necessary for good blood flow. It's interesting that... Um, there are techniques or medications actually out there that improve uh, blood flow by allowing nitric oxide to work. One of them is Viagra. Blood supply that allows erectile function uh, is dependent upon blood vessels opening up and allowing blood to flow in. With people who have uh, problems with that, their blood vessels can't open up because nitric oxide isn't working. What sildenafil or Viagra does is it restores the function of 
nitric oxide. But uric acid works in the opposite way. And that explains a couple of things. It explains why there's a 38% increased risk of erectile dysfunction in men who have high uric acid. Well, makes sense to me, you're inhibiting nitric oxide. Also, the whole notion of nitric oxide and the drugs uh, was really called out for us about a month ago when a very, very large study of 6 million people looking at their medical data revealed that men who frequently took Viagra and therefore had better preservation of blood supply had a 69% reduced risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Now, let me be clear. I'm not going down this path to advocate taking Viagra as a preventive for Alzheimer's. I'm explaining it based upon the mechanism of nitric oxide. We want nitric oxide to work. That's how Viagra works, but uric acid messes up how nitric oxide works. So step one for me would be get the uric acid level down, get it where it needs to be. And therefore you will improve blood supply from tip to Tony, from every, everywhere in the body. Well, we also know with that nitric oxide, I mean, Nobel prize uh, awarded for discovering of that molecule and its relationship to cardiovascular health and erectile dysfunction being a harbinger for cardiovascular uh, issues. And where you just go upstream here to the uric acid, which I think is the really proper way of looking at root cause issues, um, that, that's how it, it all gets tied together so nicely. Um, that's right. The, uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Dr. Murad for his a discovery of this whole pathway, the enzymes, uh, endothelial nitric oxide synthase. And I had the honor of actually talking with him about five days ago. Uh, because, you know, he's certainly interested now in what is uric acid doing and how does it relate to all this? So you're right. Nobel Prize. Yeah, love it. Well, um, I think, you know, perhaps one day for you as well, sir. Uh, it, it looks no, I don't um... think so. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I have, uh, you know, I'm doing what I need to do. And yes, and there you yes. go. I, I will uh, tell you that uh, the, this book is now on the New York Times bestseller list. That's or made the list rather. Yeah, that's uh, very exciting. The first week out, so that's awesome. that's great news. So I'm very proud of that. Yeah, and you know, it's just uh, the purpose of this book is giving people empowerment. You know, here's another tool that you can use that can really help you regain control over your metabolism. And who wouldn't want that? Yeah. So true. You know, one, um, I'm asking for a friend here. I want to clarify on the hard alcohol. Component. You're asking for a friend? I'll be your friend. <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, is it the sugary components of the hard alcohol that is raising the uric acid or is it the hard alcohol itself? So for instance, I, I, if somebody- It's probably not the sugary component because yeah. you know, what is the sugar component of vodka, for example? Right, uh, right. I, I think it's the fact that it is alcohol in its, a pure earth state. Yeah. that is metabolized to uric acid without an offset. Got so it. in wine, we get an offset. We get some bioflavonoids that are really uh, offsetting the uric acid production by having those bioflavonoids target this xanthine oxidase enzyme. Therefore, you right. don't make as much uric acid. So I think that you're just bypassing all that with the straight alcohol. Got it. And then tying that into potentially the, the roots with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, not just on the hard alcohol, component, but on uric acid with the infiltration of fat into the liver. I mean, that is a silent epidemic that is occurring now that doesn't really hit the top killers, but, you know, we are seeing clinically more and more. I mean, when you look for it, you see it, it's in, it's out there. Well, yeah, you can look for it looking at, uh, you know, the, the transaminases, uh, you can certainly ultrasound, you can certainly find it. And it's probably present what you're describing this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in about 42 percent of adults in america right now up from uh 24 percent uh in just about 20 years but having said that we know that if you drink a lot of alcohol you're going to get fatty infiltration into the liver then there's this other thing in another camp called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease whereby consumption of fructose for example stimulates fat accumulation in the liver and we always thought about those as being you know, very much disparate, but it turns out that if you uh, give alcohol to rodents, they will develop alcoholic fatty liver disease. But if you give alcohol to rodents and block 
fructose metabolism, they do not. Hmm. And what does it tell us? This is really fundamental. If you block, block the first enzyme that breaks down fructose called fructokinase, then they don't get fatty liver disease. So it's telling us that what the alcohol is doing is activating fructose production through this polyol pathway. And then this fructose goes on to damage the liver and leads to the so-called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. If you block fructose metabolism by targeting fructokinase, that doesn't happen. So what I'm saying is that all fatty liver disease, meaning both the, the so-called alcoholic and the non-alcoholic are actually one and the same. You're actually producing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because you're turning on the fructose pathway and it's the same pathway. What is very worrisome about this is that uric acid enhances the function of that enzyme, fructokinase, making this whole situation a lot worse. Wow. So that as expected, you would see a higher level of uric acid, people drinking a lot of alcohol. They're producing much more fructose, that becomes uric acid. And what does the uric acid does? Instead of shutting itself off, feedback mechanism, it's a, a feed forward process. It stimulates its own production by enhancing uh -huh. more fructose being metabolized as a survival mechanism. Right. Many wow. things in physiology end up at an at a end product that then feeds back to shut off the beginning pathway, right? Feedback inhibition. Uh, that's not the case with uric acid. There are at least three things it does to stimulate its own production. One of them is by stimul uh, stimulating this enzyme fructokinase to metabolize fructose. Another is it turns on the production of fructose by stimulating that polyol pathway to make fructose from glucose. The last thing it does is it actually uh, inhibits the loss of itself by having higher levels of insulin. Mm -hmm. by creating insulin resistance, insulin level goes up. High levels of insulin in the kidney keep the kidney from excreting uric acid. So it, it's a great mechanism in our survival days. It feed forward, keep us alive. But nowadays, look at the downstream uh, issues that are happening. Wow. Dr. Perlmutter, any last closing remarks for the listeners of What the Health? Uh, yes, indeed. And I would say that uh, Greg, our time together today maybe was a little technical, but I think probably a lot of people like that. But the point is this, that we are messaged to basically live our lives however we choose and that modern medical science is going to fix our woes. That is unfair to us because that level of uh, remediation doesn't exist. We have no treatment for Alzheimer's, for example. We have no treatment whatsoever for type 2 diabetes. We have no treatment, pharmaceutically speaking, whatsoever for high blood pressure. And why do I say that? When you are taking a blood pressure pill, for example, and your blood pressure is great, what happens when you stop that blood pressure pill? Your blood pressure goes up. So you've not treated the problem. You're treating the smoke, not the fire. You're treating the manifestation of the problem the blood pressure being elevated, but you're not treating the actual problem. And the same thing with blood sugar. Stop your metformin, a couple of days later, blood sugar goes up. So you're not actually targeting the problem. When we look at uric acid, we are getting to the root of the problem. It's not 100%, that's for sure. But it's a powerful new lever that we can pull that can help us actually uh, offset the actual causes of some of these issues and really help us regain metabolic health. So my closing statement is that we really need to recognize that it's up to us to be the stewards of our health destiny, that um, the messaging out there isn't really appropriate. Watch TV, watch the evening news. Look at the drugs that are advertised. Take this drug, that drug. I got my A1C below seven, I'm happy. Yeah. A1C below seven is almost meaningless. You know, when, when A1C above 5.6 is already associated with heart disease, Alzheimer's risk. So um, we are at their mercy. We're at the mercy of this marketing. And the call then for everybody, you know, watching our time together today is to take the reins, 
and to be the steward of your own health destiny. Love it. Dr. Perlmutter, everybody listening, watching out there, share this show. This is how we get the message out. It's why we created What the Health. Think of two people, loved ones that you want to help with their metabolic resiliency and their health. That's how we create the world that our hearts know and desire. This is What the Health. We are here on the Contact Talk Radio Tuesdays from 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific. Tune in next week. Great to see you. Thank you, Dr. Perlmutter. Thank you, Dr. Eccles. Great to see you.